Today we'll be covering the Big Thirst Chapter 7, Who Stopped the Rain? So you can see today um, we'll cover this chapter. You'll also have a quiz at the end of this, um, after the this lecture is over. We will be covering in the classroom on Tuesday, making the making the rain cloud seeding. We'll also probably be going over uh, completing reading the papers, so at least someone's draft version one of their papers. So the big third, so chapter seven, uh, Fishman introduces us to Laurie Arthur, who is an Australian rice grower. So he grows rice in Australia. And the, you might want to ask yourself, what is the reasoning for this chapter or him including these stories about Laurie Arthur in this chapter or actually in this text altogether? Laurie makes some good points. He is a rice grower in Australia, but he also uses, while he uses a lot of water, he also grows a lot of food. So there's a little bit um, of hip hypocrisy there is the fact that he uses all this water to grow food for people um, who are mad at him for growing food for them because he's using all the water. So there's this huge cycle of blame on each other um, that results in a lot of problems and I'll talk a little bit about this further but Fishman brings in a new vocabulary term for us that is called water envy. So on page 185 of this of this chapter uh, one two three four the fifth pa full paragraph down Fishman gives us this whole issue that you know he's while he's using all this water, he is feeding people. So this is where a lot of the anger comes from. And it starts off with Arthur owns 6,000 megaliters of water a year. And when he can, he uses it all. That is Arthur, alone Australian, owns and uses enough water to supply the entire city of Toowoomba for half a year. Remember Toowoomba we covered in the yuck factor. When he gets all 6,000 megaliters, he can grow enough food in the year to feed 100,000 people, which means that with half the water of the city of Toowoomba uses in a year, Arthur can raise enough food to feed the whole city for a year. And so this, that paragraph right there sets up the entire controversy that is discussed in this chapter. And Fishman tells us the story as to why this is the case. So if you go to page 187 um, and you were on the, the last paragraph, the farms, of course, are no less valuable, vulnerable to economic destruction from lack of water than the cities. And the farms are no easier to restore or replace when the water itself returns. But how do you weigh a single farmer and the food he raises that can feed 100,000 people in the city against the water needs of those very same 100,000 people? And perhaps hard of, hardest of all, who decides? How do you make choices that are fair when those needs are competing directly against each other for the very same water in a very short time? This is the... This scenario here comes into play numerous times in this semester, and that is, what should we use water for? Who has, who has more rights to water than, than others? Um, that idea of beneficial water use, we talked about this in Mike Young's economic model. We talk about this in cloud seeding. We talk about this um, in the yuck factor. We talk about this in numerous chapters in this text and in other readings is who gets the water? Who has the most rights to the water? Is it to feed people? Is it for people to use in their homes? Is it for people to run Las Vegas? Where and who decides that? Who decides who's more important than the other to have water, water rights? or access to water. Um, Pat Mulroy talked about this in, in chapter three of, of The Big Thirst when she talked about the fountains um, and in doctor's offices, they shut off fountains in doctor's offices to allow the Bellagio to have their water, um, their major water events. 
And the people in the doctor's office were like, wait a minute, we're allowed to have Fallon's. And Pat Mulroy said, no, you're not as important as the Bellagio is bringing tourist dollars in. And the same argument is brought up again in this chapter, which is Laurie Arthur grows rice in Australia, one of the driest places in the world. He grows rice, which requires rice, the, the rice uh, plant to be underwater for a specific amount of time. That is... To grow that crop there requires an enormous amount of water because of evaporation. But yet he feeds so many people. So what is right? And who decides what is right? Major, major issues. So you want to read through these sections of the chapter that talk about this issue and try and hash out. But I also want to talk about in, in about two pages, that's when Fishman introduces us to that term water envy. And this term is a really, really important term this semester. So if we go to the page, if we, we go to page 189 at the bottom, it says, it starts with Australia. Australia is experiencing the first wave of water envy. No one thinks he personally overindulges in water, but everyone can see the water gluttony of the farms upstream or the cities downstream or the next door neighbor who automatic, whose automatic lawn sprinklers run even when it's been raining. Water envy seems like a new, an all new phenomenon. And then on page 190, we'll skip that first paragraph and then the second paragraph. In a sense, water envy is like class envy or even racial enmity. It's often the result of ignorance or our inability to imagine how the world looks from the perspective of the poorer person or the Hispanic person or the person using water completely different than the way we do. This term is really important for this semester and that is that this idea of water envy really brings in a social justice aspect is the fact that we look at people and we say wait they shouldn't have rights to water I can't water my lawn so you shouldn't be able to water your lawn and um, we start judging people we start uh, conversations that enrage people or or kind of you know hit they kind of get to that point in us that um, there is a part of us that, you know, it makes us jealous of each other. It makes us kind of, you know, we start looking at each other in different light. And that terminology, that water envy is really important in this chapter, especially when we, again, we'll talk about social justice issues. Who has rights? What is be considered beneficial? What is considered um rights to first world uh, developed countries, what is considered rights to third world develop, developing countries. All of these questions need to be answered when it comes to water envy. So Fishman then brings us through more issues that are involved in this water envy issue. And on page, starting on page 199, he brings in this talk about the Murray River and what's considered normal and the idea that in order to solve the water envy problem or to even start those conversations we need to first understand how water is calculated how much water people can use how much water is available for use how we can plan ahead and one of the issues that Fishman really points out in this chapter starting on page 199 is how we calculate these water how much we how do we calculate how much water is available and how much water can be used to allocate water to people if we don't even know those basic that basic information how can we make educated decisions that could maybe take out that water envy issue and say to people well listen they use this much water we have this much water available next year Fishman then goes in to point out the major problems with this, and he introduces us to Gill, who talks about this um, issue where he says to people, he takes over the water system um, in Perth, and he says, listen, I'd like to take a look at what's to come in the future, and they calculate out the average using data all the way back to the when they first start collecting water data. So they use water data from 1905 to judge what water 
allocation should be next year. And Gil says, wait a minute, how is this possible? We could probably use the past five years of data or the past 10 years, but what happened in 1905 has no bearing on what we're looking at today and what our estimates should be in the future. We need to look at more recent numbers. And everyone says, no, 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 this is how we've always done it. And if you look on page um, 200, he talks about this issue. It's just, it's un unbelievable. But if you say here, it, it's on page 200, and I'm about the, I would say the, starting with the, the most, it's maybe two lines down. The most 21 years of rain and reservoir water look completely different from the previous 20 and from the previous six years. But Water Corporation's strategic plan didn't acknowledge the most recent 21 years of low water. It assumed a future of at least 330 gig gigaliters of rainwater runoff a year. I said to staff, well, surely the last 20 years is a better indicator of what will happen next year and the following year than the last 90 years. They said to me, no, 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 you don't understand. You have to take the entire average. The problem was from within Water Corporation. We had a consensus that the best indicator of the future was the entire past, says Gill. It turned out to be good coming from the outside clean like that. So that's just amazing that we're going to we're going to use data from 1905 to predict what the next couple years are going to look like. That's going to be factored into the average. And that's a big problem because, you know, water cycles go in ebbs and flows. You might be in a 20 year drought and then you come out of the 20 year drought. So why aren't we using more recent data when we're trying to calculate and be able to predict better future models. And with bad data, we're going to make bad decisions that lead to more water envy problems. So lastly, in this chapter, Fishman gives us what Perth did with their water problem. So in Australia, Perth decided to build a desalination plant to solve their water problem. And this, remember, is a technical solution to the commons problem. And Fishman points this out. He, he talks about this, that technical solution um, on page 209. He, on page 209, the second paragraph down, he brings to light exactly what Garrett Hardin was talking about in the tragedy of comments, which is we can solve anything we want with the technical solution, but we really need another portion of it, that extension in morality to really make a difference and change things, is that in Perth, they put a desalination plant in and people forgot about the water problem that they had because now water was available for them. They forgot that, hey, maybe this might not work and, you know, a hundred years from now, these desalination plants may break down or there might be a, um, a problem, etc. They forget about it because their immediate problem has been solved. And right there it says, but there is a much larger question about Jim Gill's handling of purse nerve rattling plunge into water scarcity. Did Jim Gill waste a good crisis? And what this means is Gill doesn't shrink from the question. He thinks in fact that is the most important question. In some ways, we define the problem and the solution within the existing framework of abundant water, says Gill, and we'll still, and we still got abundant water here. He says, what I really believe is, we just use too much water. It's an amazing leap of arrogance that to get rid of 500 milliliters of urine, we use six liters of drinking water, 12 times the amount of urine. That's crazy. It's just an example of how we are not serious in our life about what, how we manage resources. What he's saying there is, and people ask this question is, maybe you should have allowed the crisis of water scarcity to go on longer to educate people about the real issue with water. Instead, they put a technical solution in, solve the water crisis, but at the same time, they didn't educate people. So there is no extension in morality with this techno technical solution. And Garrett Hardin said, this will not work. So this is chapter um, 
Seven Who Stopped the Rain, do not forget to take your quiz.